Hello everyone and a warm welcome back to the channel. In my previous upfront video I demonstrated how a Banzai charge, the Japanese special ability, can go badly, badly wrong if you don't execute it properly. Now those of you who've watched the video will recall that I slapped some pretty harsh um, special rules on the Japanese, particularly the basically 50% chance that at any point during the game, especially from the outset, the officer in charge might lose his head and order an all-out assault, essentially a Banzai charge against a group of US Marines. And uh, the result, effectively, was that they were slaughtered almost to a man, except for the sergeant. So the question is, of course, what, what good is the Banzai attack, really? Because it seems to be a highly dangerous manoeuvre to perform. And it is. And the thing I really like about the way Upfront deals with the Banzai charge is that you, you have to be very careful how you employ it if you want to use it as a tactic. If you do what Japanese commanders did all too often historically, you will watch your men get spectacularly killed off in a depressingly short period of time, usually without accomplishing anything. So what I'm hoping to do in this scenario, this particular video, to, to contrast with what I did before, is I'm going to attempt to demonstrate how you can execute a Banzai charge a bit more intelligently and hopefully a lot more successfully. Now, of course, I don't actually know how this is going to go. It's going to be a play, a, a, you know, an open-ended playthrough, if you will. So I don't actually know what the outcome is going to be. So I'm going to tell you my plan right from the beginning. Um, this particular scenario is set in 1939 during the Nomonhan clashes uh, in Manchuria between the Soviets and the Japanese. Not a very well-known conflict against the wider backdrop of World War II, but quite a significant one and an important learning experience for both sides. Uh, now, this is presumably taking place very early in the campaign, where the infantry on both sides had a fairly even chance of attaining victory. Uh, of course, once Soviet armour turned up in numbers, the, the Japanese campaign was effectively over. They just didn't realise it until they'd suffered horrendous casualties. But this is going to be the opening days of the campaign. And again, I'm taking the lead of a squad of Japanese infantry. Only this time they're planning to hit some of their Russian opposite numbers and they're planning to hit them hard. I'm modifying the patrol scenario, the most basic of all the upfront scenarios, and uh, mainly for the simplicity. Again, I want the focus to be on how the Japanese can try to use the Banzai rules. And um, because I think it broadly fits the theme, the... The terrain in Manchuria, depending on where where you were fighting, and Nomonhan was fairly representative, I think, does broadly match the, the terrain mix you find in the patrol scenario. You might have to uh, use your imagination when you get to buildings and similar and, and consider them to be natural terrain features. But other than that, it, it works uh, fairly well. Also, again, this is going to be a daylight scenario, and that's going to be a bit more challenging for the Japanese side because, of course, making a Banzai attack in daylight is going to be tricky. So rather than yelling and dashing forward in a screaming mass from virtually the beginning of the scenario, what I plan to do here is advance the two sections of my Japanese squad, uh, employing the you know, well-known and well-tried principles of fire and manoeuvre in an attempt to gain a firepower advantage over the Soviets. Ideally, you want to severely weaken the enemy squad before you finish them with a Banzai charge because that allows you to play to the Banzai charge's strengths. The fact that you can enter close combat en masse with your entire group without having to worry about um, infiltration, morale checks, all that other stuff. The huge advantage of the Banzai rules for the Japanese, if executed properly, is that they allow them to chuck their force straight at the opposition. 
And that can be quite a powerful thing, especially if most of the enemy squad is is pinned, say. So the counterfire is going to be very weak. So the trick is going to be achieving that. Now, the reason I've chosen the Russians is because I think they make a fairly interesting opposition for the Japanese. So you you have an army whose firepower ratings are broadly very similar to the Japanese. Both, both sides seem to have placed a slightly lower premium on, on what the British army would call accurate musketry. Uh, um, compared to a lot of the other armies in the Second World War, and both emphasise the uh, decisive nature of close combat. So the Russians make a very interesting foe for the Japanese, and it's another reason why the Japanese have to be a bit careful. Because if we throw in a Banzai charge in our present state, I mean, yes, fine, the, the Russians don't shoot all that well, although they probably do at, uh, at closer ranges. But... If you throw a Banzai charge against Russians, Soviets who um, are unpinned, you run quite a risk because these are these are hot shots when it comes to close combat. And so it's another reason for the Japanese to be a bit careful. Now, a liberty I've taken mainly to overcome the the um, fact of both sides having poor long range shooting abilities. Um, is to start both sides at relative range two. I think this is quite plausible because the Imperial Japanese Army was quite adept at sneaking up on people. Every, everyone experienced that at some point during the war, certainly on the Allied side. So I find it quite plausible that they would have positioned themselves well to make an attack upon their Soviet enemy. So everyone's starting at relative range two because that represents the point at which the Soviets become aware that the Japanese are there. The Japanese realize they've been rumbled and the fight begins in earnest. It also allows both sides to actually employ more firepower cards. Again, makes it slightly trickier for the Japanese. To compensate for this, I have reduced the duration of the scenario to two decks rather than the usual three. So all that said, again, my cunning plan, such as it is, is to employ firepower to suppress the, the enemy, get my men as close as I, as I can safely do so, and then if the situation permits, throw in the Banzai charge under the most advantageous circumstances. If the plan comes together, you will be treated to the sight of a well-executed Banzai charge achieving its objective. If the plan doesn't come together, I'd like you all to know that at least in my head it was a good plan, and that I was merely thwarted by the vagaries of fate, but at least my honour is intact. So, to battle. The Japanese have the initiative in this scenario, but their initial hand draw is not actually all that useful, so they're starting in relatively open terrain. The Soviets, by contrast, are really, really blessed. So the Japanese would, of course, pass on the terrain placement, but the Soviets... The temptation might be to stick the gully on the advancing Japanese, but really what the Soviets want to do is actually keep their men a bit safer until such time as um, they're able to pop up and shoot. So I'm playing them a little defensively, but at this stage it makes sense to put the gully on their scouting group. Now note the difference in formation. I've opted for two groups because I want to make sure that the correct leadership is present to have my whole force execute a Banzai attack if it all comes together. The Soviets are being a bit more conventional. They have a base of fire and they've also got two flanking scouting groups of equal power, which is, is roughly consistent with the sort of thing they would have done at the time. So... While they are close combat hotshots, they are also doing a sensible dispersion in terms of firepower. But they're also leaving themselves open to being picked off and overwhelmed. So let's see how this goes. But anyway, their group A, their lowest, their lower morale group, is safely in a gully. Um, 
I of course have already passed and so they then will place their second terrain they're feeling all right about their center group because that's their highest morale bunch so it does make fairly good sense we'll, we'll call this a natural um, low ridge or something similar so their other group is behind this low ridge so having done their initial terrain placement they'll draw replacement cards and get what they want that that's fine so, the Japanese, I don't have very powerful, well, I have a moderately powerful firing card, a stupidly powerful firing card, which I simply cannot play at the moment, but I do have two movement cards. Um, I want to get close, and I want to get close quick. So not knowing what's in the Soviet player's hand, I'm going to take a chance that he hasn't got extremely powerful murderous firing cards, and I will order an advance. See, the other good thing about having only two groups is that in terms of the number of movement cards you're liable to get, it does mean you're a bit more mobile than the opposition overall. It will take the Soviets longer to move their whole force around if that's, that's what they want to do. So I've committed myself. I will hang on to those firing cards because you never know. And I will just draw. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. I can live with that. Luckily for me, the Soviets don't have any firing cards, but what they're going to do is possessing that movement card, they're going to begin moving their group that's safely in the gully up. Uh, again, this is a risky move on their part because, in theory, a Russian player would know what I'm capable of in terms of a banzai charge, and he's really doing me a favour by moving his men closer, but, but... There is always the possibility that he will get a decent firing card. And if he does, he will have men in position, ready to pop up from good defensive terrain and basically give me a broadside. In the meantime, I'm manoeuvring in the open, so it is chancy. And also, because he has the ability to do so, and time is very much on his side, his other two groups are simply going to try entrenching. So the central group fails to do so, as does his third group, group C. So he will draw a card and wait on events. <laughs> I'm going to pretend I didn't see that. Meanwhile, the sword of the emperor collective sword of the emperor have found my group a has found a nice rocky outcrop which they're going to occupy because all this moving in the open malarkey really doesn't suit my temperament and yes in case you're wondering i will be making all my own decisions in this game there's no there's no insanely ambitious lieutenant with a thirst for glory who's going to be ordering me to throw in a banzai charge done with him um, over to my other lot. Uh, no, I'm not going to do anything with them. I'm just going to hope. I don't really like the idea of spending any of these cards as um, cower cards, so I'm just going to hang on to them and hope. Hope I haven't made bad decisions. So over to the Soviets. They are positively drooling over that enormously powerful firing card, but there's not a lot they can do with it at the moment. So, their A group is going to emerge from the gully, however, into some nice convenient brush. And they're just going to do a quick count up because they would really love to use this card sometime soon. So at relative range three, 
Their biggest group generates 16 firepower factors, so they're not very far off being able to use that. But for the moment, they'll do what they did last turn and attempt to entrench. So we'll do them first. Ah, oh, they've dug in. Okay. And the last group has dug in as well. Typical Russians. They're very good at all this burrowing into cover. So there we go. The non-manoeuvring groups have entrenched themselves just to make my life even more difficult in terms of suppressing them. And quite satisfied with the whole really. There's no justice in this universe sometimes. Right, back to me in the meantime. I'm going to take stock here because my group A has a fair amount of firepower. They generate 16, even though they're only equipped with rifles, so it may be worth... That's 16 at relative range 4 versus the um, Soviet Group A. Um, at relative range 3... Oh, it's the same at relative range 3. The question is, how do I want to go about breaking this Soviet squad? I think, given the relative morale values, it's going to be worth trying to crack that flanking group first. It also means I've got more time, because of course targeting the larger group would burn through the deck faster. So my group A is going to open fire at the Soviet group A. They generate four firepower, reduced by one because they're in cover under the brush, so down to three. The Soviets are also going to unsportingly conceal themselves, so down to two. Let's see what happens. Private Nosenko is all right. Private Kvasnikov is okay. Private Sokolov uh, is not okay. He's been pinned. And Private Zayakov is all right. Okay, that was rather disappointing. And I think I will leave it at that. I was hoping for better, but that was worth waiting for, especially for my group that's still manoeuvring out in the open. Now, the Soviets, keen to not lose men, uh, certainly not at this early stage in the game, are going to accept the overplay of a rally too. Get Sokolov to recover himself get his composure back. Now their very formidable Group B is going to punish me for my impertinence. Or are they? No, they still can't quite play either of those cards. They need me to be closer. Okay, so they're just going to have to hold on to those and sit still for now. Probably takes nerves of steel to wait till they can see the whites of our, uh, uh, of our eyes, but it may be worth it for them. I, of course, am blissfully unaware of what's lurking in their hands. So, group me again. And I still have some firing cards, and I really want to soften the Soviets up a bit. So... It's a pity I can't play that card. It's the common curse of an 18 firepower requirement at the moment. But I do have that one. So group A is going to repeat its attack of the previous turn and see how we do. So reduce to two because the um, Soviets are in cover. Private Nosenko is pinned. Excellent. Good start. Private Kvasnikov is pinned as well. I sense a Banzai charge coming. Private Sokolov. Oh no! Drat, who wasn't looking after their rifle? It was Private Karata. Well, that's a pity. Um, so the attack strength is reduced by one. And Private Zayakov 
it's pinned as well, so that wasn't too bad. In fact, actually, that's rather good. So, OK, I'm happy with that, but I'm just going to draw another card for now. Oh, good. Now, I need to be very judicious because it's nice to have these concealment cards, but um, once I declare a Banzai charge, it's no longer possible to play concealment cards on the, uh, the groups who are committed to it. So it's very, very, very tempting to use that movement card to order my group B to just surge in towards that Soviet position and wipe them out while they're still reeling from the gunfire. But I think it's too soon and there's still too many unpinned Soviets out there, so I'm going to keep control of myself for now. As for the Soviets, Since I have unobligingly failed to move, they are going to play that hero card on young, let's say, young Yastrobov there to double his firepower. And that gives them exactly what they need to use that card, which is very bad news for me because they're going to turn it on my, my fire support group so fire strength of eight, this is going to be lethal, plus one because we're moving out in the open. It's up to nine. I am going to thank my lucky stars I didn't order a Banzai charge. and Desperately use that concealment card to bring it down to seven, but I really don't fancy our chances. So here goes. Sergeant Okimoto is not even pinned, lucky man. Private Yoruba is pinned, but still alive. Private Kobayashi is pinned. Private Fujiyama is unfortunately killed. And Private Asante um, nope, lives to fight another day and is not even pinned into the bargain. So that was extraordinarily fortunate. We had an absolute ton of Soviet firepower coming our way, and luckily only one man fell. But I don't think our ordeal is over yet, because the other Soviet group, um, Group C, has enough firepower to commit that card. And although it's nowhere near as powerful, it's quite a uh, uh, it's quite something to have a second fusillade of fire come in while you're still reeling from the first. Now, the fact that I'm moving would up that firepower level to three, but I can knock it back down to two with another concealment card. So let's see what happens. Sergeant Okimoto is fine. Private Yoruba is fine. Private Kobayashi is fine. And Private Asante is fine, thank goodness. Of course, the other worry I have is with all this shooting, the Soviets are happily burning through the deck. And they might force me to try to win this scenario through boringly conventional measures when I really wanted to demonstrate some Banzai charging to you. It's really not on. And they've got some rather handy cards now. Right. I'm in a bit of a pickle. I still can't use that firing card. Um, but I will get Private Karata to try and fix his rifle, which he does. All credit to him. That was quick and decisive. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot I can do for that group. I don't really want to use either of these as a, um, as a cower card, so I'm just going to have to draw and hope that the Divine Emperor is looking favourably upon me. So far, so good. Well, no, actually, 
maybe not. Right, the Soviets. Well, thankfully, they can't use that card because they don't have another hero card, so their fire's going to die down a bit. Also, they don't have a rally card, so their group A is still hugging the ground, wondering what on earth hit them. However, given the weakened state of my force and the fact that they're not slouches in this close combat malarkey either, they're going to try advancing fairly fearlessly from their positions, meet us head on. Because they have the numbers and they certainly have the inclination. So there we go, we're, we're a barely a third of the way through deck one of two, and already we're at relative range four. This might get bloody. They're going to draw their cards. Hmm, fairly handy. Uh, my options remain terrible, but... They are coming towards me, which is not a bad thing. So, I am going to... Really, if we want to start chucking huge firing cards around, we're going to want to be at relative range 5 anyway. So what I am going to do, because I'm fondly imagining that the Soviets have no firing cards left after that turn, and I really want to play that to exact some vengeance. So as this is, position is not doing that much for us anymore, I'm going to order my group A forward. Because it also puts us nicely in a position to bunzai that lot. Um, and because I've only played a movement card, I'm still allowed a discard. So what I am going to do is I'm going to discard that wire card onto the most dangerous Soviet group. So they have run smack into an obstacle, one which conveniently leaves them exposed. Hmm, okay, that's quite handy. I was hoping for better, but that will do. The Soviets, in the meantime, are in a bit of a jam themselves now, because their options are not quite what they wanted. Um, just for the sheer novelty of it, Private Sokolov there is going to pour some rather weak fire into my Group A. Now, in theory, I don't know whether to conceal them or not. So, his total firepower is actually zero. But that is my lower morale group. The trouble is, I don't know whether the other Soviet groups are capable of firing. I'm going to take... No, it's too much of a risk. I'm going to take that on the chin and see what happens. Because I don't... I would be worried that there'd be more fire coming from that group. They're not such a threat because with bolt-action rifles, they're not going to be doing much shooting, or at least not much effective shooting, I hope, but you never know. So I'm going to save my concealed card for my vo more vulnerable group. So Corporal Togo is fine. Ah oh, yes, as per the patrol scenario rules, that goes out of the game. Private Togami is fine. Private Sakai is fine. Private Fuchida's all right. Private Korata is pinned. Ah, oh, there's always one. Private Yumani is also pinned. Okay, there's always two, evidently. Private Fujita is pinned too. I really need to shut up. 
And lastly, Private Fusano is OK. Well, that wasn't too bad, young Private Sokolov all on his own over there. Now, there was me bracing, uh, holding on to my concealment card for all it was worth, but at the end of the day, nothing further happens from the Soviet side. So that was irritating. Meantime, what can I do? I think overall I'm going to keep them moving, because moving in the lee of the cover they've enjoyed is safer than actually stopping in open ground. However, things are decidedly unsafe for that group and they're keeping me worried, so I am going to play that as a cower card and just allow them to go to ground. Um, it means we miss out on the chance to pick up that fallen rifle, but, you know, I think we've got bigger things to worry about. So I'll draw a card. Ah, better. That's what we want. Over to the Soviets, who are still struggling with some really bad options. Now... They could have actually fired that card last turn. I've got it into my head that they uh, couldn't, but that group is now within relative range 5. But they'll do it this turn. They can't do anything to bail out their group A, and they've got no movement cards to get rid of that wire. But they will employ this card, because at relative range 5, my group A is too juicy a target to ignore. And they can certainly play it with the strength that they've got. So firepower of seven, up to eight, because we're moving. Down to six, because we're still in the lee of that, that terrain. And I'm going to bring it down to five in some desperation. So Corporal Togo is all right. Private Togami is also uh, barely all right. Private Sakai, not so all right. Private Fuchida? Nope. Oh dear. This is where it starts to get bad, I think. Private Karata? Oh my goodness, is all right. Ah, and I've just realised I forgot to apply the deduction for them firing out of wire. Now, thinking back over the numbers, it makes no difference, but I need to remember that there's a firepower of four. So, Private Umani? Ah, has panicked. And it is beneath his uh, overall, so he is killed. And we have another dropped rifle. So Private Fujita is okay, and Private Fusano is pinned. Well, that could have been an awful lot worse given the power of that card but it does leave my fellows in a bad situation. I'm not too worried because I could alleviate this problem by having Corporal Togo declare a Banzai charge. We are close enough. Um, and that would instantly rally everyone in the group, which is another advantage of the Banzai charge. If you're stuck with lots of pinned men, declaring a Banzai is a great way to turn that situation around. Um, the Soviets will do nothing else that turn, and they will just draw. The only problem is I need a movement card to declare Banzai, and I do not have one. Curses. Well, I'm going to play that to rally Private Sakai, uh, mainly because he's one of my stronger soldiers on the morale front and the chances of him not... I mean, it, it, I could rally one of the weaker ones, but the chances of them getting pinned again or worse is somewhat higher. So I think Sakai is a more valuable man to have around. Um, gone are my dreams of playing that. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to play the other rally card on my other group. 
just to get my LMG back in action because I desperately need Yoruba and his light machine gun back. And I shall draw. Let's see. Oh, good. More. Oh, yes. That's definitely what I need. Okay. It's not over yet. And some decent terrain. Exactly what I wanted. Oh, yes. In case you hadn't already figured this out, as far as possible, never, ever, ever launch a Banzai attack from open ground. Even at close range, it's asking for trouble. Always start from cover. So the Soviets still can't help Group A. Um, group B is still stuck behind its wire. However, Group C, who are out on a limb anyway there, are going to hunker down in some brush. And they're going to hope they draw something a bit more useful. Ah! If I, in theory, if I could see what was in their hand, I'd be swearing my head off now. Right, the question for the Japanese Group A, what's more important, getting into cover or rallying those men? I'm going to vote getting into cover because any subsequent fire at least will be deflected. So we get into the safety of the trees and I can worry about rallying them later, whether it's through a Banzai charge or something else. Meanwhile, we are very close to the Soviets. So 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I generate 12 firepower points with that group, but I don't have enough firepower. That's annoying. And with no movement card, it's uh, we're a bit stuck out there. So I'm going to have them attempt to dig in, which they do not do. Ah, we get a fire card of sorts. Every little helps. So not being able to do anything much that turn other than dive my group A. Oh yes, of course, the dropped rifle goes away. Um, much to my dismay, the Soviet Group A, which has spent a gratifying amount of time huddling, um, have finally rediscovered some semblance of a collective spine and are... Uh, Getting back into line. Drat. All my hard work undone. Their other two groups aren't particularly doing anything helpful. And um, they've already lost their ability to discard because of the rallying. However, their group C will attempt to entrench. And they do. Ugh. So they'll draw a card. Oh dear, I really don't want the Soviets to have more of those, especially as I have to pretend that I don't know they've got them. Uh, right, again, another difficult decision for the Japanese. With the existing unpinned men in Group A, I have enough firepower to start making a nuisance of myself. But do I want to do that? Start shooting straight away. Or do I want to rally those pinned men so that I could play a much stronger card next turn? Now, the Japanese mindset being what it is, I realised previously I'd favoured getting them to safety before rallying. But now with the option of shooting, I'm going to give in to some aggressive instincts. And they are going to direct some fire at the Soviet Group A. Um, it's reduced to one because they're in the brush and the Soviets are cautiously keeping their heads down. So it's now zero. But let's see how we do. So Private Nosenko is pinned. Good start. Private Kvasnikov is all right. Oh, and that goes out of play. Private Sokolov is all right. And Private Zayakov is all right. Well, we scared one of them. That will do. As for my other group, 
still not able to play any of these more powerful cards so I am going to have them dig in and I've just given away a movement card <laughs> no <clears throat> and to add insult to injury of course we didn't even dig in let's see what happens ah okay options return over to the Soviets Hmm. Just to exact a little bit of vengeance and also to spread the pain a bit, the Soviet Group A is going to fire on my Group B. They're quite happy with the men they've pinned in my Group B. Oh, wait, or are they? Oh, no, they can't because they're too far away. What about their Group B? They can, and although my group a, a group B is much higher morale, they're not in any kind of sensible cover. So they'll accept firing from group B that the firepower drops to three. Unfortunately, I have no cover cards at all. And they're going to try and do away with my Group B. So Sergeant Okimoto is okay. Private Yoruba is all right. Private Kobayashi is okay. And Private Asante is okay. Oh, well done, boys. Show them we are not afraid. And that will be it for the Soviets. Hmm... Not liking the look of these. So, back to the Japanese. Well, I shall certainly be rallying. Uh, oh, wait. Yes, it's still too early to throw in a Banzai attack because there are not enough pinned Soviets for my liking. So I will rally the whole of Group A's pinned men with that card. And I am going, at great risk, but I think it's worth it, I'm going by the number of high-powered uh, firing cards that have already been played so far in this deck. I'm going to take a chance that there can't be too much weaponry um, left to unload in my direction this deck. And so I'm going to risk shoving Group B forward. This is disregarding my own advice, but at least we're not chucking in a Banzai charge. So, let's hope. Ah. Okay, this is good. This is good. He says. The Soviets. They could either go for some very advantageous discarding, or they could try and wing me with that firing card. I think in this instance it makes more sense for them to do some advantageous discards. So they're going to hit me with a double whammy. They're going to keep that one for future use and commit the better sniper. So the first discard is going to be a sniper attack on my command group. The sniper is going to be aiming at Private Yoruba. Good choice, he's the one with the LMG. And he draws a zero. Oh, terrible sniper. I'll leave that there for reference. Unfortunately for me, the other card they're going to discard on me is a, a wire obstacle card. So now I know what it feels like to run headlong into one of those. All right, that wasn't so brilliant. Ooh, okay, this could get painful. Right, now I need to try and change things fast or my command group uh, is in serious trouble. Now I generate 21 firepower points at relative range 5 with this group. So I am not going to waste it. I am going to... 
Mm. Who to go for? I could wreak absolute havoc against his group A with that. But his group B is still stuck on wire and that's an insanely powerful group. And my great temptation is to try and take it out. So do you know what? I think I'm going to do it. Let's see if we can cut the head off the enemy. So firepower of seven, increase to eight because they're in wire. They are in some desperation going to play that to bring me down to seven, but I don't know how much it's going to avail them. So let's see. So Sergeant Rostov is pinned. Junior Sergeant Burlak is killed. Private Petrovsky is definitely killed. Private Yastrobov is killed. Private Shenenko is killed. Private Vakuta is pinned. And Private Zaharov is pinned. Now that was devastating. Um, I owe the Soviets a ton of discarded weaponry. So I'm just going to quickly scuttle round to my counter tray and collect three rifles and an LMG. That was horrible. I feel a twang of sympathy, and I'm the Japanese player for this scenario at any rate. Um, in the meantime, ignoring the prospect of a very easy sniper kill, I'm going to use this movement card to get rid of the wire card on my group B. We'll worry about their sniper later. So that was hideously effective. Nowhere near enough to break the Soviet squad, but we have made a mess. And actually, now might be a good time to chuck in that Banzai charge, if only I have a spare movement card. Incidentally, Banzai charges can be performed across difficult terrain. We would suffer from the presence of that wire card, as would the Soviets when it was their turn to counter-attack. But to be honest, they're in such a bad way that it might, um, it might be worth doing. Because, of course, they've lost their junior sergeant and their sergeant is pinned, so to make their lives even worse, their hand capacity is now reduced. So things have turned round really quickly. Now what to do? Of course, the downside is they have firing cards and everyone's in range. So their group A, it's not a great choice. My lower morale group is under good cover in the woods. And my exposed group is all high morale men. But they may as well give it a try. So their group A is going to shoot at my group B. I have no concealment cards, so straight three. Sergeant Okimoto is pinned. Oh dear, that's not good. Private Yoruba is fine. Kobayashi is pinned. And Asante is pinned. 
Okay, so some rather ferocious counterfire from the Soviet side, and it's not over yet. Because that group is going to follow up with that. So Sergeant Okimoto is fine. That goes out of play. Um, Yoruba is fine. That goes out of play. So we've satisfied the requirement for putting buildings cards drawn out of play. Private Kobayashi is fine. And Private Asante is fine. Okay, that's a relief. I don't really want to start losing people at the moment. And of course, because Sergeant Rostov is pinned, they only draw up to three. Right. Um, I am tempted to... Because I really do want to throw a Banzai charge in, I've got a bit of a difficult decision to make. If I overwhelm the Soviets with firepower, I am going to end up um, winning the game conventionally when I really wanted to demonstrate a Banzai charge. The trouble is, I don't have any movement cards, so I can't order a Banzai charge, and it would be inexcusably risky in any circumstance to leave those three alive when I have the chance to kill them off. Now, of course, there's every chance I might send them berserk. I don't really want to do that, although it'd be quite entertaining. Um, what to do? No, lo logic demands that I finish them off, and, and their deaths will not break the Russian squad. They're made of sterner stuff than that, but it will take away their essential leadership and the last of their um, sensible firepower. So I'm going to do that. My group A is going to try to finish off Sergeant Rostov's group. So firepower of six up to seven because they're in wire. They have no concealment cards. Um, ah, Sergeant Rostov is... Um, is uh, panicked now. Does he go berserk? No, he doesn't. Okay, so he is um, he is routed. He has had enough of this, and he has decided to leg it. Um, Private Vakuta, similarly. So he is. Routed as well. No berserk from this one. And Private Zaharov. It's hit his panic threshold. Um, and he similarly routes without going berserk. So all three men survive to probably face the wrath of their commissar later. And we have torn the centre out of the Soviet force. So that was possibly worth doing. Uh, with my last... Uh, well, I'm going to have to bring Okimoto back if I want a sensible hand size. So I'm going to do that. So Okimoto is back in charge. And... Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, still no movement cards. Come on, where are you all? Over to the Soviets, things have not gone well. Um, but they're still full of fight and capable of resisting. Um, group A is going to attempt to lay down some kind of suppressing fire on my Group B. So firepower of three. Unluckily for them, I have a concealment card to knock it down to two. Uh, Sergeant Okimoto is all right. Yoruba is fine. Kobayashi is all right. And Asante is all right. Over on the other side, one of the Soviets in Group C is going to attempt to infiltrate. So he's going to play that movement card. Brave man, he's going to go for it, especially as a load of us are pinned. I mean, why not?
and he's infiltrating from brush so uh, there's two of us unpinned he makes it well done him So I'll just nudge him a bit closer to us so I remember, but Private Storchillo has just infiltrated my group. Now I say good for him, I probably shouldn't say that, but you know, it was, it was admirably done. Mm, and they're still full of fight, clearly. Right, over to the Japanese. Not entirely sure what to do with this lot. Um, that infiltrator is highly dangerous, but um, well, for want of anything better to do, Group A will open fire at their Group A. Group B will open fire at their Group B. They have no concealment cards, so against their group A, fire strength of one reduced to zero by the brush. Ooh, Private Nosenko um, has fled. He's routed out of there. Private Kvasnikov is all right. Private Sokolov is pinned. And Private Zayakov is most definitely pinned. Okay, let's bring him down, give them more of a continuous line. That was superb shooting from my lot. Uh, meanwhile, Okimoto and Yoruba are going to fire at Group C. Firepower of two reduced to zero by the brush and their entrenchment. So Storchillo the Infiltrator unfortunately has just been pinned so he's lost his infiltration status that's a shame the poor guy worked really hard to get that um private oh dear private soloviev is pinned as well private Kristov is all right and private wihailoft is all right but not for much longer you see this this is the perfect situation uh, in which to throw in a Banzai charge. But unfortunately for me, I can't because I lack movement cards. Very, very... Ah! And right on cue, they present themselves. So there we go. Now, I just need to remind myself of something, because I have a horrible feeling the Russians might be close to their breaking threshold. Um, yes, unfortunately, I have just pushed the Russians over their breaking threshold. However, for the purposes of getting a Banzai charge in, I am going to ignore that little fact and assume that these men are made of slightly sterner stuff. So they are going to stick around. On the Soviet turn... They are going to rally their better group. But unfortunately, they can do very little else. And they'll just draw that card. Right, the time has come. Group A gets the order for a Banzai charge. So a movement card is played in the sideways position and we are throwing in a Banzai charge versus Group A. 
Um, and that's all I'll do. So it's over to the Soviets. They have this one chance to try and shoot some of us down before this happens. Now, the only group with enough firepower is Group C. So they have a firepower of two, um, reduced to one because of their um, echelon away from us. Now, I can't play any kind of concealment card on my men. So up to firepower two because of movement, but reduced to zero because of the woods. So let's see what happens. Corporal Togo is all right. Private Tagami is fine. Private Sakai is all right. Private Fuchida is okay. Private Karata is not okay. Now, remember, with a Banzai, there is no pinning. If you are hit and pinned, it's treated as a kill. So Karata stops a bullet. Fujita's all right. And Fuzano's all right. So aside from poor Karata, everyone else made it through. Um, the Soviets can do nothing else, so they draw their card and wait for the inevitable. Relative range is five. The Japanese Group A sweeps straight in onto the poor Soviet position. So Corporal Togo is going to be attacking Private Zayakov. Private Togami is also going to pile in on poor, poor Zayakov. Private Sakai is going to do the decent thing and go after Sokolov. Private Fuchida is going to go for Kvasnikov. Private Fujita is going to go after Kvasnikov as well. And lastly, but not least, Private Fusano is also going to go after Kvasnikov. Ouch! So neither of us have any concealment cards, so it's going to be a straight fight. I'm going to resolve Kvasnikov first. Fuchida, with a close combat value of 7, is running up to him, and he only has a close combat value of 6. Now, unfortunately, because Fuchida has two men backing him up, he gets a significant bonus, plus his draw 0, well... He still has 13. Kvasnikov has 6 plus 0. Nope. He disappears under a screaming tide of enemy soldiers, trying desperately to hold his position. Sokolov is pinned, but he only faces Sakai. Sakai is coming at him with a close combat value of 8. Ah, reduced to 4. So Sokolov's close combat value is 3. Oh dear. And it stays three. So despite stumbling, Sakai still manages to kill his man. And lastly, poor old Zayakov, pinned with a close combat value of three against Corporal Togo with a close combat value of ten. He hardly needs to, uh, Togami backing him up, but he's still got him. Um, final value of twelve. And poor Zayakov is going to draw anyway, but it avails him nothing. So the Japanese squad, or at least that side of it, despite losing a man on the way in, sweeps into the Soviet position and just wipes them out. And that, boys and girls, is how you throw in a sensible Banzai charge. I'm going to call it there because, in theory, the Soviets broke some time ago, well, a turn earlier. But I hope that's given you an idea of how, in the right circumstance, a Banzai charge can be a battle winner. If you manage to batter your opponent, demoralize them, pin a load of them, generally render them ineffective, an incredibly stylish coup de grace is a Banzai charge. And against most opponents, the Japanese have the numbers for it. With their squad size of 13 men on average, that's a lot. The only people who surpass them are the Russians with 15. But even so, if you can isolate a small weak group and crush them, that can swing the game for you.
So I hope that's uh, somewhat rehabilitated the bonsai charge in people's minds in the aftermath of my previous video, which showed how terribly wrong it can go. Um, if you like playing the Japanese side in upfront or, or just fancy giving them a try, I really recommend trying to go for this. It It's a bit of a holy grail. It's very, very difficult to achieve. In fact, I'm mildly surprised I got away with it. There were some hairy points in this game where I thought the Japanese were not going to do that well. So I'm really pleased that it's turned out the way it has just to counterbalance the terrible experience the other Japanese squad had against the US Marines in the previous video. Um, and I hope that's given you an inkling of how to do it. Um, yes, it's difficult, but it's a wonderful, wonderful um, bit of narrative and it makes for a really memorable game. You'll always remember the times you successfully pulled off a Banzai charge. So there we go. As always, um, hope it's been of use uh, and or interest. Thank you so much for following me in this series, um, especially all you fellow Upfront fans out there. It's always great to see you guys and my regulars on the channel. Um, so thank you so, so much. A big hello to you if you're visiting my channel for the first time. Um, if you're into Upfront, um, please do check out some of my other videos um, and I hope they prove of interest and, and, and entertain you as well. Um, yes, either way, whether you're brand spanking new and just generally curious about what I've put on this channel or you're one of my frequent guests, really, really awesome to see you guys. Thank you for your company. It's always appreciated. I hope I'll see you again soon, and I really appreciate you tuning in. Bye.